Hello everybody, Raven Knight here, and welcome to the video y'all been waiting for, Analyzing Mako. Now here's the thing, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, with each of the hero skins that have come out, I have done a, one video where I read through the lore, and then another video right after that where I talk about my thoughts on the lore, so that I can keep the two videos separate. I've done Lord Ramiel, I've done Bolthorn, now it's time to do Mako. Okay, so something kind of interesting that I thought I'd point out is when looking at Maiko's story, I took a look back at Lord Ramiel and Bolthorn as well, and I found something kind of interesting. With uh, Lord Ramiel's story, I was kind of not satisfied with the story very much, but the design was cool. With Bolthorn, I wasn't really satisfied with the design, and the story was good with maybe a few problems, but still better than Lord Ramiel's. But with Maiko... I, I have no complaints. The story was awesome, and the design is awesome. I love the design. I could gush over the design. Um, it looks so uniquely different from a Kensei, and yet exactly what I'd expect a Kensei to look like. I love the flowing mane of multicolored hair. Uh, I love the armor with like the demons engraved in it with their eyes looking around. I love the fact that part of her armor is ripped off so you can see her bare arm, and you can see the tattoos running along it, which are actually demons. Um, it looks terrifying. In fact, it's funny, her face mask, her Mingu, it's supposed to be a mask, but it almost looks like part of her face at this point. It it all looks really good. It is such a great design for a Kensei hero skin. Definitely fits the yokai horror feel. Really, really liked it. Now, with that said, we're not here to talk hero design, we're here to talk story. So, first and foremost, one thing that I want to praise Maiko's story for is the fact that it made it more personal. With Ramiel and Bolthorn, it wasn't that personal. Both had stakes involved in the collective. Ramiel was out trying to protect um, his peace and his people and his castle. Ra and uh, Bolthorn was trying to save Valkenheim and his village because he was the Jarl, all that stuff. They were trying to do things for everyone else, which is, you know, altruistic. It's good. It's helpful. But it's also a little generic. I liked the fact that Maiko... Though she was trying to save the village, who granted it was a much more personal fight for her as she was trying to save her younger brother, Moturi, which I thought that that actually makes it a little bit more interesting for me and for her character. Because here's the thing, not everyone can be Superman. Not everyone can be, I have to protect the world. Sometimes we just have to be satisfied with just, I need to protect my brother. I need to protect my mother. I need to protect my wife. I need to protect my, you know, that kind of thing. We, we have these um, personal desires that sometimes trump our overall desires. Like, here, here's the question. Um, one of the reasons I didn't like the original Superman movie was because I felt like the ending was a cop-out. Lex Luthor had set it up so that Superman had to make a choice. He either had to save um, a city from being destroyed with a nuclear bomb, or he had to save Lois Lane. And he chose Lois first, but then he reverses time by flying around the Earth so that he can have a redo. I said, no, 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 that's bad, that's bad to me. Um, here's the thing, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, I get that, and a true hero most of the time will be the one who says, I need to save everyone first. This is something that heroes have to weigh a lot, like in the game Batman Arkham City, when, uh, pro when Hugo Strange is dropping bombs on uh, the city of inmates, Batman wants to go save his crush, but Alfred reminds him, Gotham needs you first. Gotham needs Batman first. You need to save Gotham first, then focus on other matters. In this case, Maiko, she is saving the village, but her first priority is her brother. She makes that very clear, and I do definitely like that. I like that that adds a little bit more to her character. It shows us what she prioritizes. It shows us what she puts at the highest value, and that's important for a character. Um, now, her relationship with Moturi, I would have liked to have seen it fleshed out a little bit. They did okay with what they had, and granted, I know that they can't focus too much on it. They, they gave us a, little, a few tidbits. They established that she trained him herself. He was bullied as a kid because he came home that one time all beat up. So she, made, she, she trained him to be an Orochi. Now, that all does beg a few questions, like how do you um, become a class of warrior in uh, the samurai? How do you do that? Like, I mean, like it, I used to think that, you know... You became a Kensei because of your status, um, but apparently not. Maybe, uh, like, how did he become an Orochi? Is there a trial to become an Orochi? Like, stuff like that. But th that's not important. That's not as important as everything else. So then the yokai are chasing after them. Now, one thing I didn't like as much in this is the way the story portrays yokai. 
it almost portrayed them as just at first they were just kind of zombies just kind of ghouls or something and that's not entirely what a um yokai was of course you could have some undead yokai that's true but they don't go into different kinds of yokai which is weird because the battle pass and the outfits and stuff that came with the halloween event all referenced various different kinds of yokai in fact i did a video with general fujikiyo um, and he did a video prior to that where he talked about all the different yokai referenced in the For Honor Halloween event. So go check out those two videos. Those links will be in the description too. But with all those different yokai references you could make, I'm surprised they didn't make more references. But again, I suppose since you only have three parts to your story, you need to prioritize what you can. But in this, we only see those zombie yokai that attack her and then kidnap Moturi, which begs a question. Why, why on earth did the yokai just kidnap Moturi but then leave her alone. Because in the story, Maturi gets kidnapped, but then the yokai just kind of stop attacking her. Why? Why'd they do that? Was the Jorogumo only interested in one of them? The, did she not want to feed on more than just the one? Like, what was going on there? That was a little weird, but again, moving on. Uh, and then when she goes into that abandoned house to find the Momono dagger, she comes across that long, lanky um, yokai. And that could be a lot of different yokai, um, but they didn't really go into great specifics. Um, now when she goes into the house, it was definitely trying to go for a horror feel. Basically the idea is that she wanted to get the Momono dagger because it's the only weapon that can kill a yokai. It's the only thing that is capable of doing it. Now the Momono dagger is our relic of the, of the season. Each season so far has had relics. In the first season with, uh, Ramiel, it was the chalice. In the second season with Bolthorn, it was the scarab bracelet. In this one, it's a dagger. Okay, can I just say this? Thank you, Ubisoft, for finally stepping away from the immortality shtick. The thing I did not like about the Scarab Bracelet and the immor and the Dragon Chalice, or whatever they call it, was both pretty much did the same thing. Both grant immortality, but at a price. You know what I mean? Um, Ramiel's Cup, it grants you immortality, but it saps away your emotions. The uh, Biscara Bracelet, it grants you immortality and allows you to reverse death, but it brings a plague unless you're the Pharaoh. It, it, I was kind of sick of that after the Scarab Bracelet. You know, I was kind of like, can we get something else? A dagger designed to kill a yokai? That I can get behind. But now there are questions. And unfortunately, they are questions that hurt the story just a little bit. For example, the Chalice. Well, we know where that came from. It was formed as a pact between the, between the Wyverns and Ramiel. The Cursed Scarab Bracelet, we know where that came from. It was forged by the Egyptian gods to give to the Pharaoh of Egypt. Where did the Momono Dagger come from? Who forged that? Who made it? Why was only one made? Why aren't there more? Why did they make it the way they did? Was it forged by the gods? Was it forged by the yokai? Why would the yokai make something that could kill them? See, I don't want to ask those questions. Even just a slight blurb, because they mention another legend, another myth. Yes, you're right, that is a myth. Please explain. <laughs> that's the thing about myths. I want to know more. If I said, who's Zeus? And you just said, that's another myth. No, no, who's Zeus? <laughs> Tell me. You know, and the Momono Dagger is one of those. I'm kind of like, I want to know more about this thing. But as we see, what the Momono Dagger does is it can kill a yokai. But what it does, it doesn't just kill them. It saps their essence into the dagger and infuses it into the holder of the dagger. So in doing so, the dagger actually puts the demon inside of the user and the demon tries to fight for control of the body. So only a truly strong-willed person who can resist the demons can use the dagger. All right, that is an interesting concept, and I do like it. I'm kind of sick of the whole relic that also curses you thing, but you know what? This is fine. We'll deal with it. I actually think that it's a good twist. I think it's a, I think it's a nice price to pay for using the dagger. You need to use it to get rid of the threat, but you yourself will be corrupted as a result. I'm down with that. That's cool. Okay, so, um, she manages to fight off this demon, and I also kind of like the fact that the demon tried to manipulate her by using visions of her brother, and even mentions her brother, mentions Moturi by name. That means that the yokai seem to be in constant contact with each other. That means that they know what each one of them's doing. And also, kind of wonders, does the yokai, because the yokai says, poor little brother, like, so you know the relationship between Moturi and Mako. You know that the Jorogumo has possession of him. How do you know all this? Are you all in constant telepathy? Does the Jorogumo have specific interest in Motori? Is Maiko somehow related in some way? Like, how do y'all know this? And why does it why does it matter that you got that you've stolen Motori? Or can you read the emotions and feelings 
of Maiko? Can you feel what she's feeling? Can you create illusions that reflect her desires and her wants? If that's the case, then this makes a lot more sense. But if you can't, how the heck did you know what you were doing? Um, a little weird that way. And I know these are small nitpicks, but as a story writer, some of these questions will come up as you listen to it. Now, you could argue, oh, well, he's just a supernatural being. He just knows things. Well, granted, I suppose. But it would have made a lot more sense if you um, added a little bit more context to that. Well, anyway, she gets hold of the dagger, kills the first demon, and immediately she starts feeling the demon crawling around inside her trying to gain possession of her body, and she realizes, oh crap, I could be in trouble, but we don't have time to worry about that, we need to start killing demons, and kill demons she does, and it's in part three where I start asking more questions, and that's where the story starts to hurt a little bit. In part three, it establishes that she went around killing as many demons as she could, taking in the demons into herself and all of them thrashing around inside of her, and she's having trouble focusing on the task at hand because she's busy not only fighting the Jorogumo, but also fighting the demons inside of her. That's good. That's good conflict. But she also establishes that she has allies fighting with her, and she it says she doesn't know their names, but they know hers. That establishes that Maiko has been rallying supporters and helpers and fighters to fight the Jorogumo alongside her. When did she do this? And why do they agree to help her? Do they know what the Momono Dagger is doing to her? Did she tell them? Are they all samurai or are they all from different factions who want to help stop the Jorogumo threat? Like, I wanted that explained. I felt like part three jumped over some important information. Like, I would have liked to know who Maiko went to for help. Or did she go to anyone for help? Did these volunteers just show up and volunteer their own service? That's a question I would have liked to answer. But they don't answer that. That's one of the weaker parts of the story. It would it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that, hey, where did this person come from? Why are they helping you? Why are they assisting you? I thought this was your own crusade. When did you get help? That kind of thing. I would have liked that explained a bit more, but, you know, tit for tat. So she finally confronts the Jorogumo, and eventually, after fighting her own, you know, demons, literally, and watching some of her allies get killed, she finally plunges the dagger into the Jorogumo's heart, killing it, and then sucking her essence into herself. So now she has all these demons plus the Jorogumo wrestling inside of her. Now, I will say this. The Jorogumo is called twice the mother of demons, the mother of yokai. I want to reiterate this. I made a video on the Jorogumo, and I said it there. I'll say it here again. The Jorogumo is not canonically in Japanese folklore a mother of demons. Jorogumo do not give birth to more yokai. Yokai come from various different places and are formed in various different ways. The Jorogumo is not necessarily connected to all of them. Now, if you wanted to make the argument that Jorogumo is a very powerful yokai and thus her essence, her energy, her power might attract other yokai to where she is, that might be an interesting twist. But to say she's our mother... That begs a lot of questions you don't want me asking, because if she's the source of all yokai, um, how far could she potentially spread that taint? How come yokai look demonstrably different and not all of them have spider-like qualities? Um, how does possession work? Are the possessed people she takes possession of yokai, or are they just other yokai possessing them? There, a lot of questions start to be asked, and... Um, they may not seem important to everyone, but again, as a writer, I'm looking for consistency um, and I'm trying to understand how these things work. But besides that, she kills the Jorogumo, so that's good. Jorogumo is dead. Yay, we're done with that, right? Okay, but now she's in trouble because she knows she's losing to the demons. Eventually, she's going to succumb to them. Motori is rescued. He comes to her and her last request is that she be sealed inside of the... Uh, cave where the yokai were originally sealed so that if she does get corrupted by them and she becomes an unkillable yokai herself um she won't be a threat to anyone and then it ends with an epilogue where it says that today little kids still test each other by going out to try to touch the yokai tree but they don't do it out of fear anymore they do it out of reverence um for what maiko did this proposes a few interesting ideas for one thing if it says today children still do that does that mean that the story of Maiko, like Ramiel, is history? Does that mean that this is something that happened in ancient history? Bolthorn's story can't be history because that was what introduced the Magi, and the Magi are a current thing in For Honor. So that's not history. But Ramiel was history. That's the ancient history of Heathmore. Is the story of Maiko ancient history of Heathmore? 
Is that a possibility? In the trailer for the game, we see a Magi in the trailer, but that's just to keep advertising Magi. Could it be that the story of Maiko is more history than it is modern? I, I choose to think it's more modern, but the way they said it in that epilogue, it made it sound like nowadays kids, like all of this was just a legend that someone was telling. And hey, that's cool if that's what you wanted to do. I prefer to think that it's more modern, like a more current thing that's going on in For Honor. But that that's that's just me. Um, but there are, but there is another question. Um, she was sealed up. What happens if the seal gets broken again? I mean, it was never explained how the seal got broken the first time. That's that. I think that's the biggest inconsistency. We established that these demons and the Jorogumo have been sealed up for a long, long time. What broke them out? Why was the seal now broken? And if you don't know what broke the seal the first time, what makes you think it won't break a second time? And then Maiko the Jorogumo won't become a threat. Actually, that'd be kind of cool. Maiko the Jorogumo. That, that'd be kind of cool. Um, imagine the Jorogumo with Maiko's torso on it instead of that white-haired lady. God, that'd be kind of freaky. Um, but still, I would li- those, I think, were my primary problems. I think if I had to name any problems with the story, there would be only three. The fact that we never get any explanation as to where the dagger comes from. We never get any explanation as to how the demons broke out in the first place. And we never get any explanation as to where these allies of uh, Maiko come from and how she recruited them. They may seem like small things, but hey, think of it like this. If my only complaints about the story are those small things that in the grand scheme of things aren't that significant, then that's a good story right there. But if those three things have been addressed, and they very easily could be, all they required was a few sentences here and there to help establish a few things. Like, for example, you could establish how had the seal been broken. It was said to have been indestructible, but someone or something must have found a way because when someone went to check the seal, the rope had been cut. This implies that someone deliberately let them out, and that could be a setup for the next season. Like, who freed the yokai? Maybe that's going to be a villain for the next season. You know, that, that was a way you could do it. Or with the dagger, you could establish it was crafted by a man who hoped to save his wife from the yokai, and he had created the perfect weapon, but in saving his wife, he himself succumbed to the demon and became a demon himself. That would, impl- that would explain where it came from, why it was made, and why no more were made. Because the person who made it couldn't replicate it because he made the one, used it, didn't realize what it would do to him, and it corrupted him. That would be that explanation. And then as for the people she recruited, maybe as she was going on her yokai crusade, people respected her and it said, as she went about killing yokai, the people who witnessed what she did ran to her side, flocked to her banner, and said, allow us to fight with you. And that's how she got her army. That, again... Just a few sentences throughout could fix some of these plot holes that I notice, and it would be just fine. So I feel like if the writer had just done a little bit more on that, it would be great. But again, let me just reiterate, this is the best story we've gotten so far. It's well written. Maiko's goals and motives are clear as day and personal. They're not just, I want to save the world. No, it's, I want to save my brother. It also ends on a very dark and even sad note that even though she saved her brother, she couldn't save herself. She had to pay a price for the power she got. There is a price that was very, very serious for her. And yes, Ramiel paid a price and Bolthorn both paid a price for their relics too. But I feel like with Maiko, it felt that much more personal so the reader could feel the struggle she was going through. Plus, I like how throughout part three, it's describing just how fierce the demons are fighting for control. And they're not just angry or manipulative, they're also begging, they're whining they're crying like she says at one point that tears are rolling down her face but she can't tell if they're her tears or the demon's tears that's good writing it's the idea that how much of the demon suffering how many of them were once human you know like there's there's stuff there um i really did appreciate that and i think that they did a great job writing it it's kind of funny to me um rom yell and bolthorn while not terrible stories left something to be desired this one i just had really three problems with it and if you fix those i'm good with it Um, I felt it was a well-written story. I felt like it was excellent lore, excellent Halloween, spooky kind of feel to it. Um, I liked following it along. Reading it was a blast. I got to say, the diction was excellent. The the, The manner in which it was written, that's some quality writing right there. And that's coming from a guy who writes stories almost for a living, okay? So, in any case, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I enjoyed going over Maiko. I look forward to the next uh, Hero Skin coming out next season. Um, But so far, Maiko is definitely my favorite. 
Really loved uh, reading through this and really loved analyzing her design. I hope you guys enjoyed. Please leave a comment down below about your thoughts about Maiko. What do you think about her compared to Bolthorn and Ramiel? Um, don't forget to leave a like on the video and don't forget to support the channel by either subscribing. If you haven't subscribed al already, check out the Teespring store. The promo is only around for a limited time, two weeks. You get 10% off on any purchase with the promo code Raven. So check that out at the Teespring store. Link is in the description. And don't forget to check out my Patreon if you want to help support me further. Thank you guys so much. And I will see you in my next video. Take care.